My name is Nevin Cohen. I'm the director of the Urban Food Policy Institute, and I'll be very brief. I just want to introduce the project um, and, and turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, at the Institute, we work to ensure that cities have just healthy and resilient food systems. And a core part of that, and I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure, is the importance of data in identifying and highlighting problems, uh, giving us tools to work through and solve those problems, and helping us sort of see issues in uh, different ways by framing the issues differently, depending on the data that's presented and how the data is presented. So we, uh, a couple of years ago, wrote a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation that was funded uh, to create a prototype food environment equity dashboard for New York City that involved, and can we have the second slide, please, Rosita? Um, gathering together both research partners and a range of community partners uh, to think through what are the important issues facing New York in, the, in terms of the food system? Uh, what are the key indicators or metrics that are missing and should be readily accessible and what are the ways that we could visualize that information that would be useful to both um, uh, ordinary stakeholders, individuals, advocacy organizations, service providers like food pantries to improve their operations, and city officials to change policy. Uh, and you'll see the, the, the partners are listed on this slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, we looked at several different aspects of food insecurity, one of the most pressing problems facing New York, especially uh, during and post pandemic. Uh, we, we looked at uh, participation in public programs like school food and SNAP. Uh, we looked at the emergency food system and how adequate it uh, was in providing uh, food to the uh, most food insecure uh, people in New York City. And we looked at a way to think about food access in terms of the affordability of food rather than simply the proximity of supermarkets to people's homes. And so what we want to focus on today is just one of those indicators, uh, focusing on school food participation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague. Um, I think Yvette is um, taking over from here or Rosita? Yes, Yvette will be taking over and um, you will share with us a live demo. Thanks. And please introduce yourself uh, to everyone. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Yvette, and I am a research fellow at the Urban Food Policy Institute. And I've been working on this project since the beginning. So um, it's been a great experience and happy to see it come to a point where we can share it all with you. Um, so I assume everyone can see my screen. Great. So I'm going to briefly walk through the school food dashboard and the data that uh, this dashboard is based on is all uh, open data. So we pulled it from various data sets from the Department of Ed. And the data reflect the 2018-2019 school year. Hopefully, you know, if this project moves forward, we obviously want to update it with more recent data as well as show multiple years of data so that we can see changes over time. But what I'm showing here is an overview of the data that we've pulled together. So the top two bar graphs on the left-hand side show percent breakfast participation, and on the right shows percent lunch participation. And we calculated this looking at the average daily participation in terms of the number of meals divided by the average daily attendance for each school. So for breakfast overall, across all of New York City, 22% of students are participating in the school breakfast. And on the right-hand side, you can see that 65% for New York City overall is participating in lunch. And you can see variation in the different boroughs. So for example, the Bronx and Queens are slightly higher than the overall New York City average. The next two bar graphs, we are trying to show percent participation relative to uh, need. And so we have data on the percentage of students from low-income families um, for each school. 
And so, for example, if a school was reporting 50% lunch participation and 50% of its student body was from low income families, then that school would have a metric of one. Um, if the school had 50% lunch participation and 100% of its students were low income, that would equal 0.5. So ideally, you would want to see this number around one or above. And so what we see for breakfast is for New York City overall, um, 0.31. And for lunch, it's higher at 0.89. And so we don't have the data to show the percentage of low income students participating in the meals. So this metric is essentially trying to be a proxy for that. And then finally on the bottom, we know that students um, decrease um, you know, eating school meals as they age through the different types of schools. So we've split it out by elementary school, middle school, and high school. And what we show here are a series of what we call box and whisker plots. And we have breakfast on the top and lunch on the bottom. And so you can see for lunch, Overall for New York City, 79% of elementary school students are participating in lunch. And you can hover over these box and whisker plots to get more information. Um, basically about 50% of the schools are in the, the gray box, the two gray boxes together. And when you hover over any one particular figure, you can see more information. So for Manhattan, the average is 72% participation. So you can see that it's lower than the New York City average. So when you move to middle schools, you can see that overall 62% of students are participating in lunch and decreases further to 39% um, when we look at high schools. And so of the four metrics that we've reported up here, percent breakfast participation, percent lunch, and then the percent participation relative to the percentage of low income students, you can delve into any of these four indicators further by clicking on any of these buttons on the right hand side. So we're going to look at lunch to get more detail. And so now we're specifically looking at lunch participation and you can see a map with all the schools. They're color-coded uh, according to the lunch participation with the red and orange being lower and the blue being higher. On the bottom, we have a scatter plot where going up vertically is the percentage of lunch participation. Going across horizontally is the percentage of students from low-income families. And each of these dots is a school. We have this dashed line here and this represents where the percent lunch participation would equal the percentage of students from low income families. So any of the schools below the dashed line would indicate schools with a higher percentage of low income students um, compared to lunch. And so as we hover over, you can see um, the different information for each of the schools. And then we have the box and whisker plots similar to what we saw before. So now I'll walk through the filters that you can use. So you can filter by borough. So if you're interested in you know, any of the five boroughs specifically, you can filter by borough. Um, you can also filter by percent lunch participation um, by using the slider. So for example, if you were interested in looking at schools with very high participation because we want to identify you know, potential best practices, you can just use the slider and you can see that the map is now filtered for those schools that have between 90 and 100% participation. And you can hover over any of the dots to get information on the school as well as the lunch. You can also filter by school type, elementary, middle, or high school. And so I'll filter and look at just high schools for now. And you can see that the map has become you know, much more red because high schoolers um, have lower rates of participation. 
And then we have a variety of districts that we can filter on as well, school district, community district, or city council district. So for example, if I wanted to just look at school district number 12, I could select that. And you can see that we're now filtered for school district 12. And the filter for high schools is still on. So these, each dot just represents high schools within school district 12. And you can see that there are um, schools right next to each other that have wide variation in participation. So I think the idea is to hopefully use this as a tool to understand why we have these differences and um, you know, try and leverage best practices um, to increase participation in various schools. And you'll notice as we filter on the top with the map, the figures on the bottom are also being filtered. So the scatter plot now shows high schools in school district 12, and you can see they're all clustered down here in terms of having higher percentages of students from low-income families um, than they do lunch participation. And then we also have the box and whisker plots. And what you can see here is the median or the average for school lunch participation in high schools in school district 12 is 48%. It's actually higher than the overall New York City median of 39%. So I'm going to clear these filters and just show you a couple more things. So if you're just interested in searching for a specific school, we have a search bar here that you can type in. So I put in Douglas here and you can see there's a couple of schools with Douglas in their name. And so you can just find your school of interest. And then finally, if you're interested in looking at data for a particular school um, for both breakfast and lunch, rather than jumping back and forth from this dashboard to our breakfast dashboard, you can click on this button here in the lower right of the map and it will take you to another page which shows the information in a tabular format. And so you can, again, search by school. So I put in 165 here and you can see um, it'll pull all the schools that have 165 in their name. You can see the school type and the, the districts that they're in, number of students enrolled, percent lunch participation, percent breakfast, percent low income, and we also have a number of lunch periods. And you can also, similar to previous, you can search by a certain district and pull up everything in that particular district of interest. So I think those were the main features that we wanted to review with you. Um, so I will turn it back over to Rosita and we look forward to discussing this more with you. Thank you so much, Yvette. Um, my name is Dr. Rosie Tiliev. I'm Director of Policy at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute and have had the pleasure to uh, work on this project with Nevin and Yvette um, over the past uh, year, um, as well as with our fantastic community partners. And we have uh, the pleasure um, and honor to have community food advocates um, today with us to, um, to discuss further some of the aspects of the school food uh, data and dashboard and how we can use this as a tool actually in their practice to advance um, ex and expand uh, school meal participation in New York City uh, in New York State. Uh, more recently. So um, we are thrilled to have um, Liz Ackles, Executive Director of Community Food Advocates, um, Anna Lilia Reza, who is the Director of Youth uh, Leadership, as well as three youth food advocates, um, students uh, at high schools in New York City, uh, Ashley Young at uh, Stevenson High School, uh, Faith, um, Catherine Jones, who is sophomore at Brooklyn Technical High School, uh, and Yasmin Bonilla, who is senior at Francis uh, Lewis High School uh, in Queens. I'll paste again um, the flyer with uh, our speaker bios and some additional resources for those of you who may have joined, joined uh, us just now. Um, so you can um, explore further um, and um, maybe we can 
you know, come back to some of these resources um, again uh, during the discussion portion. Thank you, Z, uh, again for pasting it as well. Um, so here um, we are hoping to um, start um, some of the um, conversation around uh, what might be um, driving some of the numbers, some of the participation rates um, Yvette showed. And again, uh, I would like to emphasize that this is data from 2018, 2019 school year. So things may have and certainly have changed since, since then. Uh, we purposefully used data before the pandemic because of the drastic changes, um, the city and, and, the, and the school food and all um, other um, you know, systems and departments and infrastructure have have undergone. Um, so this is important to keep in mind. But here you see three of the sky high schools um, our youth food advocates um, are attending and have um, really close knowledge, lived experience of what school food and school meal participation feels like in their daily lives there. Um, so again, this is uh, Stevenson High School in Manhattan, Brooklyn Technical High School in Brooklyn, and Francis Lewis High School um, in Queens. Um, and you can see um, all three of these schools are, are relatively large schools, um, and they have um, more than half or uh, close to half of the students um, coming from low-income families. So school meal participation is really important there. Um, some have had their cafeterias redesigned, and I'm sure um, our uh, guest panelists would touch on the importance of that or the influence of that on the school meal participation. Um, but just to give you an overview of how um, you could use the dashboard and this tool to zoom in and explore further uh, both um, the school through the map dash uh, element of the dashboard, but also the detailed um, tables, um, which um, Yvette showed at the end of, of the walkthrough. So this is the data you see here. Um, so lunch participation, breakfast participation, percent low income, number of lunch periods, uh, which uh, we also um, wanted to explore if, if that's a factor affecting participation. Um, so without further ado, um, I wanted to turn um, now the, the um, presentation to the discussion segment and, and, and portion of our forum. Uh, specifically, um, I would like to ask um, our youth food advocates um, and guest panelists to speak to um, these three questions. And actually question two and three are also for Anna, Lilia and Lise. Um, but first, um, for, for our youth food advocates, um, we wanted to hear your thoughts on whether the numbers um, you see, so those from the previous slide, um, reflect your experience with the school, uh, what factors do you think may influence uh, school meal participation rates um, that are presented in this dashboard? Again, um, based on what you have experienced in the school um, and you are um, of course also actively advocating for um, expanding meal participation there. Um, so we would love to, to hear your thoughts um, and anyone feel free to, to jump in um, and, and um, share your insight. Um, hello, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm coming from Stuyvesant High School, and these numbers pretty accurately reflect kind of what I see in my school cafeteria. Um, and I think some of the factors that really contribute to that is kind of like the competitive foods. In my school, at least, there's tons of vending machines kind of like placed throughout the cafeteria when people are kind of trying to be to try and being pushed to get school food, they kind of have this other option. And also being in the location in downtown Manhattan, there's tons of other food options in the open campus structure. So a lot of those kind of contribute to why kind of the participation is a lot lower than we hope to see it. I would love to add on to that point um, and just mention that at Francis Lewis High School, our student organization offers very popular snacks in their office, things that the kids love and they would buy on their own if they were not in school. So it's really easy for kids to just line up, get a pass, go to the SO office and pick up those more popular, um, definitely more unhealthy snacks as opposed to getting the free lunch that's also available because it's just simply they like it better and it's it's available. Um, and not to mention the student organization also allows it to be very easy to access these snacks because they offer not only um, ability to buy the food with cash, but also Apple Pay and things of that nature. So it's really easy for kids to, you know, take part in that kind of food eating uh, as opposed to the more healthy options that are offered in the cafeteria. I agree with all the previous statements, especially with the competitive foods. There's a stigma surrounding school food um, that's present in my school where they consider school food because it's free to be of lesser quality. They find it un unappetizing. So a lot of times people won't eat the, uh, the food because they honestly would prefer something in the vending machine, which is which are most times unhealthy, like Pop-Tarts and um, 
Rice Krispie treats, but mm. they would just prefer to buy um, lunch and to eat the school food because of like appearance. Sometimes there's not even space in the cafeteria. So some pe people would just skip um, lunch completely in my school because we have like 6,000 students. There's not always gonna be enough space for each period for people to be able to sit down and have their lunch. So that is something that affects um, some students to be able to get lunch at my school, which is what I see. Um, adding on to that point made by Faith, I think cafeteria environment is a really big reason why we're seeing lower participation rates in my school. Um, like Faith, it's a really overpopulated school. We have almost 4,000 students. And so when you're eating lunch, you're kind of sitting shoulder to shoulder with other kids. It's not really comfortable. Um, and it's still like that today. Even though we have received an enhanced cafeteria, our seating arrangements are still pretty cramped. It's not a very comfortable place to eat. And I think for that reason, a lot of students just prefer to go to the library where they can, you know, have more space for their books to maybe even to study during their free periods. Um, and sometimes the courtyard is open, so they prefer to go outside. Um, yeah, really anywhere but the cafeteria, just because it is so cramped and kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, and adding on to kind of the cafeteria environment, a lot of kids at my school prefer to go outside just to like, whether or not even just to go for lunch, but just to hang out with their friends, socialize and get fresh air. Um, but my school, unfortunately, has a rule that you can only re-enter the building five minutes before the cafeteria um, the cafeteria closes or the, the period ends. So that really affects people who might want to have cafeteria food and go outside. They aren't able to do both. And which is why kind of we want to implement kind of like a grab and go station, maybe somewhere near like the exits of school buildings for kids who want to like both eat school lunch, but also spend time outside and with their friends. Great. Thank you. These are excellent insight. And I think the kind of, um, you know, experience based, um, you know, suggestions that could help us better understand both how to um, plan next steps for uh, maybe expanding um, both understanding and data on, on these important questions, but also how we can, you know, partner with schools and school principals and staff and, and you as advocates um, in this space to, to um, you know, advance both data um, as well as, you know, knowledge and advocacy um, moving forward. But I wanted um, now to turn also to question number two, and um, Liz um, and Anna, Lila, feel free to jump in here. Um, Community Food Advocates um, has not only led, but won the campaign for universal school lunch uh, in New York City and leading the nation um, in, in, in this effort. Um, so we, we uh, would love your thoughts on, on how do you think data in a tool like this dashboard, um, and in general, the effort to um, really collate resource, uh, sort, different data sources, different um, um, data visualizations could be of value to your work. Um, how do you how do you think and, and see the dashboard um, being being uh, uh, useful for for the advocacy and and you know both youth food advocacy but also broadly com community food advocacy uh, for school lunch um, in New York City and uh, more broadly. Uh, I think you're on the mute list. <laughs> okay, I'll start us off, Anna Lilia. And I just, I see my my colleague Agnes Molnar, our colleague Agnes Molnar is on here, and I just want to uh, give a shout out to her because Agnes, all this data that you've compiled, Agnes has been compiling manually for over thirty years, and it's because of her ability to do that. I mean, the technology is amazing and what you all have done is, is really amazing. So I just want to say that. Um, but it's really the data analysis that helps inform um, one of the, the ways that informs the advocacy that we do. Um, you know, so a, a tool like this um, makes it very easily accessible and um, easily um, screened out for different things. So, you you know, you can look at, um, there are things that you can identify with this and things that you can't, right? You have to be in schools to know, and that's what the students and, and people on the ground um, play such an important role in informing. But you can see um, things like innovations that are happening, what's the impact? Um, or it raises questions that, you know, about why is this school right here have low participation in the one right next door not. I mean, one of the things that we look at that we think is interesting within the school buildings themselves is why in co-located campuses, why some schools in co-located campuses have high participation and others don't. 
That's the ultimate question. Same cafeteria, same service, same everything. But um, it's it's a these kind of tools are a, a way to um, it's really quite amazing and to be able to look at variables that can be mapped around participation, about demographics, about income levels, where where we have that that data, to um, to both come up with solutions that we can identify. And also it raises questions for us. A lot of the time it raises, it raises a lot of questions almost more than answering the questions. So I think that that's an important point. Anna Lilia, over to you. Yeah, sure. Hi everyone. Um, I think the visualization part of the tool is uh, very useful. This is where we start our starting point when we're working with young people is getting these numbers, having them understand what's happening in their own schools. And then having that reflection of what, from your experience, why is this happening? And the, the visualization part of it, I think, is very helpful for us organizationally when we're speaking with council members, when we're talking about their specific district. They want to know what's happening in their district. They want to understand um, what's happening in their community. Same thing with our young people. If you want to know what's happening in your community, this is one of those ways of being able to reflect that back in a visual way that we haven't until this point been able to do ourselves. And so it's really great to see this um as that kind of a tool so um yeah I mean obviously there's like a lot of layers I you know it would be wonderful to see those trends this is one year alone it's so wonderful to be able to understand it um when you're looking at trends um across time so very helpful I guess also sorry uh also with school food obviously you have to constantly like make sure um, school food is continuous, like the environment, the experience, the participation, you have to constantly check up on it every single year because there can be different factors that can cause it to increase or to decrease. And so having data like this can allow us to be able to pinpoint issues that we see with school food to see if um, maybe some like advocacy work that we've done, like um, increasing budgets, let's for, for example, for cafeteria enhancements has increased participation and has had a positive effect. Or maybe um, if like a certain advocacy method just didn't like work, there was no like impact, the numbers stay the same. That is also a, a useful resource to be able to pinpoint um, how effective our um, strategies are and to, to go from there to really um, try to create strategies that allows us to start brainstorming ways on how we can strive to improve um, the numbers for participation, because that is our main goal, to make sure that we come up with the best strategies in order to uh, enhance and maximize the, uh, the beneficial experiences students can have in the cafeteria. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. And then Lily, Liz, these were um, excellent, excellent insights. And again, this is a prototype. I want to remind everyone um, it's work in progress. Um, and we, we really welcome everyone's thoughts, input, um, you know, in the chat, but also afterwards. Um, I think um, Z shared a link to the website, the better um, version of, of the website we um, just released. And this is a soft launch also for, um, for the website itself, this event. So uh, we welcome everyone's thoughts and, and suggestions on how to improve it. But um, just to, to, to come back to some of the, the points you, you mentioned, and Nevin, uh, Yvette, feel free, free Jump, uh, jump also in in you know the, this conversation. I think the um, emphasis you placed also on the importance of um, using also almost live these data. You know dashboards. The value of dashboards sometimes is really to to be able to to pinpoint or take the pulse uh, of um, some issues as they unfold. Um, so again, this is as Anna Lily emphasized, just one year. But if we were able to you know even live or at least across multiple years, visualize some of these trends. Uh, we know uh, some of you spoke to the importance of um, cafeteria redesign and how uh, that you know, could be an important intervention and the city is certainly investing um, you know, resources um, in, in this kind of intervention. So you know, can we see the effect you know, across multiple schools and also across multiple years of those interventions and how that could be a tool to, uh, not the only one, but um, one of the tools to, to support um, better uh, overall uh, school food experience as well as um, even nutritional outcomes. Uh, some research has been done on the type of foods um, uh, students um, tend to consume more, um, especially fruits and vegetables uh, as a result of the different school food environment and experience. You know, 
Rosetta, I don't know if jumping to question three, I, I just mm -hmm. think that some of the suggestions for refinements and improvements were identified by the students here. And um, because it's like deeper, you know, some of the things that we know are variables, um, like competitive foods, if they're available and to what degree, I, you know, these are um, time of meals, like the range of time of meals might be a factor, open campus or closed campus. Um, if there's grab and go for breakfast and lunch and how that how that works, you know, like, um, and of course the availability of the redesigned cafeterias. I mean, th those are among some of the things that just came up within this conversation about things that we know. I mean, there are so many variables around school food participation um, that you can get lost in the detail of it. So it's like lifting up what are some of the thematic things and and these we know are things that have a have a great impact. And you know, the competitive food issue is a long standing challenge. Um service to delivery model, someone just said yes, and especially for breakfast, because breakfast participation is so low. Um, you know, what are the the models, including the grab and go for older students and in the classroom for younger students and what that all means. These are great suggestions. And we also welcome thinking through with 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 you students and, and advocates alike. Um, what are the best methods for collecting this information? What what should we ask the Department of Education to collect if they're not collecting it already? If they're collecting it and not making it publicly available, what should be made publicly available? And you know, are there data points that need to be crowdsourced because they're based on the on the ground experience of students. And how do we do that? There are complications of sort of collecting information from students, um, ethical issues involved. How do we overcome those issues to make sure that we can actually update the dashboard in real time? I think um, as far as the data that's being collected, I think this is a pretty good um, a starting point and um, it's being shared, right? I think that this is really, uh, once you start getting into the all of those details that Liz was mentioning, I, I don't know that it's possible um, to be collecting from school by school um, at our at our size. Um, I do think the leaning on the voices of young people is really a key part of understanding those differences. Um, so as far as from like the the what's available on open data, this this is really the key of what we look at as well. Um, and the way that you're visualizing it, the the income thresholds and all that that's really that's all there available for us to to look at right um so really you guys are already starting to do that by inviting our young people to speak here to share share that experience because i really do think um that those nuances from day to day and living it day to day is really a key part of it great thank you Anna Lilia. thank you everyone um I think we're now ready to um, switch to the segment with Q&A with the audience. Z, are we ready um, for, for that? And um, maybe we can you know, open the chat if it hasn't been open for or specifically focus on questions from the audience. Yeah, I'll, I'll open the, the audio so folks can unmute themselves if uh, you want to ask a question. Also, uh, if you're not comfortable, you don't have access to mic, please drop your questions in the chat. Uh, so there was a couple of questions uh, while uh, the, the panel was happening. So I just want to bring those uh, forward right now uh, first. Uh, so there is demographic data by schools. Is it a way to uh, get that layer in to the dashboard? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we can certainly add into the table section, but um, we can look into somehow incorporating that into the maps and the visuals as well. I think that's something that had come up before is potentially useful, so we can certainly look into it. And just to clarify, the, the demographic data we have is on the school population, not the participants in school food. Right, yeah. There was an initial question about the expected outcome of the webinar, and it's, uh, as we've said, uh, we, we'd love to get your feedback. So even after the webinar is over, um, if you can uh, email us or um, uh, contact us for a Zoom chat if you're interested, we would love to hear more detailed feedback about how we can make this tool better. And if you have comments on other um, indicators within our dashboard, we'd love to hear that as well. Uh, Claire has her hand raised. Uh, hi, my name is Claire. I, I grew up in New York and I'm now a researcher in food at the University of Vermont. Um, 
I was just thinking about my experience in school food participation in New York, which is that in elementary school, all my friends got school lunch. So I started getting school lunch. And in high school, no one got school lunch and I never got school lunch. And I feel like that like culture element um, anecdotally from my experience plays such a big role in if students are eating lunch on campus. And I wanted to ask like the people who are students now, does that resonate with you and, and researchers? Like, has there been any work to uh, assess that sort of culture of lunch, either, you know, quantitatively through this data that's publicly available or through other efforts or just what you think about that? Well, I definitely see a stigma present when it comes to school food in Brooklyn Tech. Uh, first off, because this, the food is free, it's considered like if you get this food sometimes that you don't have enough money to get your own lunch, that you just couldn't afford, because you couldn't afford lunch, like that means you're of a lower economic uh, status. And so that in, in of itself is like a stigma. Not only that, People have complaints about the quality of the food um, and basically saying that the quality of the food is like how unappetizing it is, like how it looks, how it smells. And so because of that, people that get school food, school lunch are, again, stigmatized um, for receiving it because of like different factors or different perceptions around the food being provided. Yeah, and I'll just um, to add on to that, like we know universal free school meals was a foundational change that, that happened and needed to happen to start wearing away at the stigma. We know um, enhancing the cafeterias and making the food um, much more appealing and what, you know, like a college campus and the seating areas like that, all these things work to break down um, the notion that's been in place in school food for decades throughout this country where kids are divided by income, that it's a, a program just for poor kids. So it, it takes a lot of work and creativity um, from both the Office of Food and Nutrition Services and advocates to, to push for, for changes to make sure that we're really changing the narrative, paying attention to what the students are saying, because that this trend of that was pointed out earlier by that, you know, elementary school children eat school meals and then it goes down as kids get older. Well, that's not surprising in terms of um, student development and stigma and understanding, you know, like the distinctions, income distinctions. And we see that play out a lot of different ways in schools around, around income. And certainly school food is the place. This is not just in New York City, this is nationally, that this really plays out in the most, um, um, in a very significant way. So all the things that, that we are always working towards is, is eliminating that so that older students that need the food as much as the younger students um, are, whose families are struggling financially as much as the younger students who sit out or buy competitive foods, such as whether it's potato chips, you know, you could buy something cheap, even with a dollar that holds your stomach for a while. May not be good for you, but it, but it, potato chips hold you for a while. Cookies hold you for a while. Um, so it's, it's, it's figuring all of that out and really being creative and inventive in how to take on these challenges. And knowing that this is, this is decades in the making. Um, so it doesn't just go poof and, and disappear. And so we have to work at it. Yeah, I want to add to that in terms of on um, the nutrition side. So um, obviously, this is, you know, I, I think I saw some um, comments about the nutrition as well on the in the chat and um when we're talking about that perception of the food being unhealthy um the usda has standards for school food and new york city exceeds those standards a lot of the time if we're talking about a one dollar slice of pizza and if you want to compare the caloric intake the sodium all of those key nutritional uh components of a slice of pizza we've done that comparison um, for a school food slice versus a 
a regular $1 pizza slice from the street. And the healthier option is going to be school food. And we normally don't see young people making that connection regularly, that school food tends to be healthier. And the, the you know, here's where you start to get into the weeds of your compromising taste for and flavor in terms of nutrition. And how do you do that in keeping that balanced with the nutrition standards and making sure that the menu is appealing um, in our case, in our city's case, to a million students. Um, so yeah, so that, you know, along with the perception of the poverty perception that comes with the program itself, there is additional perception of the unhealthy level um, of the meals. So um, yeah. Yeah, and just to add on kind of like the herd mentality that usually school food has is really present at my school. I think when my group of friends go out, even if I want a school lunch, I think it's sometimes like a more like nice option to go out with my friends, which is why I think grab and go usually works pretty well in schools. You're kind of able to have both the options. Um, and that's definitely a big reason at my school. I think sometimes the participation isn't as high. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, I, I remember in middle school and elementary school, having lunchtime was like the best time of the day. Like Yes, I could finally eat lunch. It was something I really looked forward to. And I know my peers did too. But, you know, in high school, that changed completely, like a complete 180. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there's this culture where students are just, they're just not a fan of school food. They don't like it. They're not willing to try it because they just have this idea in their mind that it's unappetizing. It's boring, bland, not flavorful. And I think this is something that all of us can agree on. Um, in, in my economics class, for example, like the teacher was talking to us about how we can save money on school food. And one of my peers suggested that we, or how we can save money on food. And one of my peers suggested that we eat school food. And everyone was like, no, that's disgusting. I would not ever eat that food. I would never put that in my body. So it's just this kind of like culture that has developed where we just don't like school food and we're not willing to give it a try, even as the food is changing and becoming more updated. And I feel like that's why enhanced cafeterias are so important. They're that first step in modernizing our cafeterias, revamping them and making them more attractive to um, us high schoolers. Yeah, and, and the food has really changed over time. I mean, it, you know, it's still serving eight or 900,000 meals a day, which it has its own challenges, but it really, there has been transformations um, all of the, the meals are student tested. Um, you know, there are always challenges with, with carrying that out across, across the whole range. But, um, you know, the, there's a, a lot of, there is and there needs to be continued proactive um, work across the board to, again, we're, we're talking, there's a, there's a, a taint to the food. It, it doesn't matter. A lot of the kids haven't even tasted it. It's just the perception. And, you know, one kid in the classroom says something and, you know, for a high school student, everyone says, ooh, whether they believe it or not, whether they've experienced it or not. And that sends a signal that, you know, to all the other kids and that, that has an impact. I've been thinking about this question. I wonder... Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to say that one thing missing here are adult role models, and they're important. When the teachers and the principal walk away and, and won't be in the cafeteria, don't want to be there, and they don't want to eat it, that's a very strong message that goes out. By the way, everything that's being said, I have heard for over 40 years, and how little has changed, and I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I was going to ask whether uh, it would be useful to look at the the positive outliers in in the school system, or has someone done that already and and actually gone out and 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 tried to figure out what, what what's going right at some of the schools? Uh, is it just that they're closed campuses and students don't have an alternative, or is there something? Uh, uh, is it the the physical layout of the campus, or is it something uh, going on in the in the in the, among the the faculty and the student culture. I do think part of what um, Agnes just mentioned about the adult role models is key. And this doesn't have to do necessarily with just um, the school food, but the school overall culture. So if you're in a, a school environment and um, the teachers 
uh, you know, we, we've seen this, right? The teachers are coming down to the lunchroom, the principals walking around in the lunchroom. There's a really, um, when they're creating a sense of community throughout the rest of the day, throughout the rest of the school, um, you do see a little bit of a difference, but that is a really good point. Um, that, that's actually a really good way for us to use that tool to start looking at those outliers um, and honing in on them. Um, but I do, I do think the school culture plays a key, a key role in that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we've we've heard from principals in the redesigned uh, high schools is from some of them, like they all the, the principals want them, and is that it it's transformational to the school, not just the cafeteria, but to the school environment. Um, it takes it from a dreaded place to a place where students are more eager to participate. Um, it goes from institutional to valued. Um, so, and one of the things that we've heard from, from Agnes, um, from other colleagues that have been in schools a lot is, it is true that the, the administration of the school and the interest of the, how school food is seen in the school and, and the relationship between the administration and the cafeteria the folks who run the cafeteria makes a difference to how to, to participation. Um, it makes a big difference. Schools with principals and other administrators who are interested, think school meals are important, um, are engaged. Uh, there's respect and mutual respect back and forth in terms of school food staff and the administration. That reflects on how the, the program is thought of and incorporated in the school. And that reflects to the students. Uh, Chef Garahan here. I have been involved. Chef moved the schools since the beginning and now just trying to revive it uh, solely here. I work with one school, but it's a shame that, you know, that data definitely shows that we need to have that program in every school, at least at some point, which would, uh, you know, change the atmosphere a little bit. School lunch, cafeteria, seeing a chef in there every day doing something. Uh, that that could play a big part in your data. It certainly shows that that's needed. And same with the other suggestion that the culture is is just not there. Thank you. And I think we have another raised hand um, that that has been up for a bit. Uh, do you want to pop in? Uh, yes. Hi, my name's Abena. Um, yeah, I just wanted to check. I heard the the comment about uh, uh, role modeling. Um, in terms of eating the school food. And I believe this is in regards to like uh, the food um, uh, within the Department of Education school systems. So it's been a long time for me since I've been a, a teacher, but I taught, you know, it was right in my community many years ago. And I, unless something has changed, we as teachers, I would, we had to do time in the cafeteria to, you know, help monitor the children. We were told that we could not eat any of the food from the children. Has that changed? Because I don't see how else that modeling could occur um, if, if, you know, unless that rule has changed. That was absolutely forbidden. I remember seeing many of the students wasting good food, you know, uh, carrots and things of that nature. And I was a new teacher and that's what I was told. And But I will say modeling does matter because I taught right in the neighborhood where I live in Harlem. And I'll never forget one day coming out of a supermarket and some of my students saw me and they said, they said to me, um, one of them said, Miss Smith, you buy groceries? And I said, yes, <laughs> you know, but, but the main thing is what I loved about that is it, I thought, I just found that um, for them, it was just, um, it was just very much uh, reaffirming for them to see, look, my teacher lives in my neighborhood. Uh, she buys groceries where I shop and things of that nature. So modeling does matter. So I don't want to go on any longer, but unless they change something like that, I, me personally as a teacher, I, back when I was a teacher, I would have never, I would have loved to have sat with my children and had lunch with them. Instead, they had me there just watching them for behavioral reasons. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank you. That has changed. I'll say like, I think remember being in elementary school and being shocked to see my teachers outside of school too. So <laughs> That's always amazing when you see your teachers outside of a school building. You think that's where they live. Um, it has changed actually. I believe that um, for start even that piece of teachers doing the um the monitoring of the cafeteria, that's also not part of um 
that's been negotiated out, I believe. And so t there's actually aides that do the monitoring of school cafeterias. Um, I believe teachers still may be able to purchase um, that has gone back and forth a couple of different times. So I believe teachers are now able to purchase lunch if they wish to purchase lunch and um, principals always get uh, their uh, meals for free. So any principal at any school is able to eat for free in the school cafeteria. Uh, I would love to add on. Um, at my school, there is the student cafeteria, but there's also a separate teacher cafeteria. So I've never seen my teachers eat the school food that I'm eating. And if they are eating it, it's in a completely different space. So I don't think students are ever seeing that. I've also heard that the food that the teachers get is not the same that we get. It's like wraps and sandwiches that I've never heard of or never seen in my in the cafeteria that I go to. So yeah, I'm I'm also uh I don't think teachers are or students are seeing their teachers eat the same food that they're eating. Yeah, I'll actually also add, and I think part of the role modeling, I think we can go many different directions with that as well. But I'll add that um, one, I don't think they're making the, the, I think that was at some point, again, there was a separate food for teachers. I think it's all the same food now. But um, two, uh, there's also the role modeling of what I was a teacher as well. And let me say I was not like the teacher who was known to have the, the classroom parties because I wasn't allowing soda in my classroom and I wasn't allowing junk food in my classroom. And so when we're talking about role modeling, we're talking about that whole role modeling, right? Like we use outside foods and fast foods as a reward for students a lot of the time. And so there is some role modeling that can be happening within the constraints of whatever the current guidelines are for faculty and, and principals and staff to be receiving school food. Um, there is some potential there, um, but there's we have to think about like holistically what food is coming into the school buildings. I think that's a good note to end on. I'm gonna just repost the, the speaker bios in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, does anyone want to note anything else? Oh, I just want to thank once again um, our phenomena, you youth food advocates. Uh, thank you so much for your insight. Um, really, without the lived experience of what school food feels like every day, um, we, we, we won't uh, make uh, any meaningful progress. Data is important. Data grounds us, allows us to see the big picture. But without the daily picture and the daily experiences, um, we can you know lose sight of what really matters the most. So thank you so much for your your um, wisdom, your insight, your experiences. We really look forward um, to continuing um, this partnership and collaboration um, in, in the coming months and years. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so much, Anna Lydia, for your leadership, um, for, for, for your um, you know, really thoughtful, thoughtful responses and feedback, not only today, but throughout the development of this prototype dashboard. Um, your comments, your insight um, have really made it much, much stronger prototype. Again, even if it's still in progress, um, we feel confident it will help us uh, build an even stronger tool and a way to represent need um, uh, in, in the city and, and, and across multiple years and, and campuses. And I would like to thank um, my colleagues, Nevin Cohen, Yvette, um, for, for their hard work in making this happen. Um, and for um, um, I would like to ex express my gratitude also to um, NYC um, Open Data Week 2023, uh, to Z for hosting us, and uh, Kate um, from the NYC Open Data um, team for uh, shepherding us throughout uh, the whole process and organizing the event. Thank you, everyone, and thank you all in the audience for your excellent questions and for attending today.